Take your Bibles and turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1. We'll be reading a few verses there in just a minute. We're going to start at verse 3. The message today is actually going to be out of verse 6, but we wanted to start at verse 3 so you just have the whole context of what's going on there. So Philippians chapter 1. On June 4th, 1940, in the wake of what had become a complete Nazi onslaught on the European continent, Winston Churchill had the very difficult and daunting task of addressing British Parliament and really addressing the nation collectively about what they faced in front of them, what the challenges were that they were about to step into. And in his typical style, he didn't pull any punches. That's typical Churchill. He bluntly talked about the other nations that had already fallen before Germans, Germany's onslaught. He described the war that was coming to their shores in terms of sacrifice and loss. And so he was very realistic about what they were facing. But that wasn't the main thing that his speech is remembered for. What made his speech immediately famous and what has kind of kept it through the decades is one of the most famous speeches of all time was how he was still able to project in the middle of that this deep assurance despite how bad things looked. Ultimate victory. This is what he was able to communicate to them. Ultimate victory was never going to be in question. Even hearing his words today, they still echo with this sort of kind of steely confidence, don't they? Listen to what he says. These, these words immediately just kind of bring confidence to us. He says this, Even though large tracts of Europe and many old and famous states have fallen or may fall into the grip of the Gestapo and all the odious apparatus of Nazi rule, we shall not flag or fail. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France, we shall fight on the seas and oceans, we shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air, we shall defend our island whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender and face value the words in and of themselves are able to just instill a much needed tenacity that's what they needed in that day and it's those words themselves are able to do that but what made them stick was kind of the deeper meaning that was underneath those words because for those who were listening closely there was hidden phrasing inside of this speech churchill had carefully chosen to deliver most of this message in old english and what that did for those, and that was on purpose, because what that did for those who could hear it, they realized that Churchill is effectively importing into these words the entire glorious legacy of the British Empire. Everything that it stood for and had stood for for centuries was kind of imported into this speech. One listener who was listening, he, he heard it, he describes his response this way. It sent shivers, not of fear, down my spine. I think that one of the reasons why one is stirred by his Elizabethan phrases is that one feels the whole massive backing of power and resolve behind them like a great fortress. I love this phrase. They are never words for words' sake. In facing a dark night, what his countrymen needed to be reminded of more than anything else was what had come before them, and the assurance that day was going to break again. There was a dawn on the other side of this night. They were going to make it through. And Christian, what lies before us in this text this morning is something that we need to hear, that we need to be reminded of in the midst of our battles. It's one of these passages that's meant to instill inside of us hope and courage. But if we look a little closer, it's astounding to see, to feel the theological weight that stands behind these words, what Paul is saying this morning. These, these are not words for words' sake. And so let's read together, again, picking up in verse 3, and we're going to read down, and the sermon this morning will be out of verse 6. This is God's holy, 
and his inspired word speaking to us today. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word this morning. Well, as John mentioned last week, Paul has opened this letter with an explosion of gratitude and gratefulness to the Lord for the church in Philippi. And here in verse 6, in the middle of that, he sort of digresses a little bit. It's almost as if in this thanksgiving, this expression of thanksgiving, what it's done in his heart and in his mind, it's brought this fresh wave of confidence that he has for the church and for the people there. And he just can't help but express that to them. It, Paul is one of these guys, he's a great example in this. If there's something that could impart some spiritual good to the people he's talking to, he's not going to hold back. He's going to say it. If, he's, if he believes and is convinced of this, and he believes it could do spiritual good, he's going he's to express it. And so that's what he's doing here today. And so he begins, and I love how forcefully uh, this verse opens. He says, and I am sure of this. In the original, there's an intensification an intensification that Paul's using. Um, it's the equivalent, like us today, we would be saying, I've been convinced of this very thing. This very thing. And so whenever a person uses a phrase like that, we tend to kind of lean in a little bit, don't we? Immediately, we want to automatically, inevitably, we want to hear, well, what are you so sure of? I mean, come on, Paul. Don't leave us hanging. What is this thing that you are so confident of? Tell us. And the answer for the church had to have been fairly surprising. Because he's saying, from a prison cell, mind you, here is what I'm confident in. Here is what I am sure of. He says, I'm confident that the good work that started in you is going to continue on, and it's going to continue on to completion, and it's going to continue on all the way to the end. That's what he says I'm confident of. By itself, by itself, on its own, in a vacuum, those are startling words. They're, they kind of wake us up to just hear something like that, the expression of confidence. But we can't forget the church that he's speaking to when he says these things, the context of, of who, what he's speaking to. Moises Silva, in his commentary on Philippians, he describes the church this way. He says, this is the current condition of the church when Paul writes and says, I am sure of this. This is how the, he describes the church. The Philippians themselves, however, were undergoing some serious difficulties. Opponents of the Christian community were causing great alarm in the congregation, and the Judaizing threat, that's the legalistic threat, was beginning to make itself felt. Physical needs were producing anxiety among the members who had begun to wonder whether their Christian faith was capable of sustaining them. All of those factors combined to create disagreements, distrust, and a poisonous spirit of self-seeking. The leadership of the church, particularly in the persons of Iodia and Syntyche, had fallen into the sin of dissension, and, listen to this, and the general health of the church had deteriorated considerably. So that was the state of the church when Paul writes. In other words, the church in Philippi is made up of people, real people, who are dealing with real issues. And yet, despite that condition, this is the church these are the people that he's expressing this confidence for. And we, we just kind of stand in amazement of that. None of their struggles, get this, none of their struggles are lost on Paul. He's not in, he's not in denial. He's not living in, in a state of uh, uh, uninformed. He knows exactly, in fact, he, he calls out specifics. He knows exactly what's going on. They haven't pulled the wool over his eyes. Just like Churchill, he's fully aware of the challenges that are in front of this church, and yet he talks about, and he talks about those challenges later on in the text. We'll see that later on in the letter. He talks specifically about those challenges. But, but, before he gets to any of that, before he gets to any of that, here he is saying, I am sure of this. 
Before he even launches into any of that, he's saying, I am sure of this. He says, and and not only that, I am sure of this very thing. And so how did he get to that point? How did he end up there? How do we get to that point? How can we be aware, realistic about very real struggles, very hard striving in the course of our days, and at the same time we are experiencing real confidence, bold confidence? How do we get there? Well, this morning we're going to be looking at two pieces that make up this confidence for Paul. And as we do that, the hope, the aim of looking at this particular text, I'm just going to tell you the aim right now. The aim of this particular text and the hope that we have this morning is that it moves us, moves us where we are in our very real circumstances towards that hope, towards more of an awareness of it, towards that confidence. That's our aim this morning. And so the first part are the reasons for Paul's confidence. We're going to see that in the middle of the verse. There's the reasons for Paul's confidence. And the second part, in the very end of the verse, we'll see are the, is the extent of Paul's confidence. The extent of his confidence. And so first, the reasons for Paul's confidence. You don't have to go very far into bookstores, which there, I guess there's not many bookstores anymore, but on Amazon, to find books on all different titles on the power of positive thinking. If you can envision it, if you can dream something, then you can go out and accomplish it. That's, that's that message. And in some ways, it's, it's been helpful. It's, it's motivated people to, to move on in, in spite of adversity and to achieve things that they were not able to achieve. But in other ways, that also can lead to this sort of misplaced confidence where we have, we have confidence in our own abilities somehow independent and to the exclusion of God. And that's why a lot of what's written in that particular area has sometimes very little substance. Not all of it, but some of it. It sounds good, but even if it's well written, there's not really, there's nothing behind it backing it up to make it true. And so they end up being a lot of times words, good sounding words, but words for words sake. That's where they end up. But that's not the kind of confidence that Paul is talking about this morning. That's not it at all. He has more objective reasons. He has concrete reasons, things that are rock solid. He joyfully expresses his faith for the church in Philippi. He joyfully is expressing it, but get this, he is not lightly expressing it. There's a difference. He's joyfully expressing it. It's overflowing. It's a digression. It's a fresh wave. But even despite all of that, it's not the same thing. It's not a lightly held confidence. And the difference between those two is Paul's theology. Paul's theology. That's what stands behind them. These words, that's what's standing there. His reasons, and his understanding of God's character, his nature, and his understanding of what God has done in their midst. And so first we want to notice that Paul's confidence for the Philippians, really it's not ultimately in the Philippians. So his confidence for the, for the Philippians is not ultimately in the Philippians, and that's a key point. His confidence includes the things that have happened in their church. Those are are things that have happened in their midst. But ultimately, ultimately for Paul, his confidence is not in them. His confidence is in the character and the very nature of God himself. He describes God as one who has begun a good work in you. that's, That's part of what makes God who he is. Paul knows that from the very first page of the Bible, God, God is a God who initiates good works. In fact, the, the participle that he uses here to, to stand in, in, in the, as, a, as a name of God, the participle that he uses is derived from the same phrase that you open the Bible with in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning. This, this phrase, that's how he describes God. God is that God. The God who created and ordered the cosmos is the exact same one who has begun a good work in their midst. That's what he's referencing when he uses that. When there was nothing to their lives but chaos and darkness, God is the one who had intervened. And what God starts, he will always complete. Paul knows this. I don't know how many of you can relate, but I love starting new projects. It's great. 
It's so fun. There's the idea that this, this is going to be the greatest thing probably ever accomplished. And you're just excited, and you jump in the middle of it. And then somewhere along the way, you start to figure out, this is going to be a lot harder than I thought. This is going to require more time. I'm going to need to get some experts. I'm going to need to YouTube this and watch and try to find out how I'm supposed to do this. And then you start finding out it's going to cost more money. You go back to the hardware store three or four times. And the same guy, you try to avoid that guy because you already talked to him earlier today. You don't want to come back to that guy. You, you go to the next aisle and see if you can just kind of figure it out yourself. You end up talking to that guy later, just <laughs> FYI. Um, <clears throat> but in the middle of all of those things that start to kind of weave into the project and you start to realize what it's going to take, the enthusiasm can start to wane a little bit. The enthusiasm is to finish, finishing a project is a, little, a lot harder than starting a project. Well, God's not like that. He doesn't start things without having every intention to finish them. Heaven doesn't have a closet full of half-finished projects that God started and then gave up on. It's not in his nature to leave things unfinished. He didn't do it in creation, and he's certainly not going to do it in redemption. And we have to remember, this is important, we have to remember that from the outset, from the very beginning, God knew the full payment it was going to initiate a good work in people like us. From the very beginning, he knew it. To even get started, to even get started, God had to go all in. To even get started. And he did that. He went all in when he knew exactly how fickle we would be. None of those things stopped him. There wasn't a moment where he got into the project and thought, well, this is more than I want to handle right now. How often are we tempted to think that God's somehow exasperated with us? Or that one day, one of these days, he's finally just going to give up on enough of my shenanigans, and he's going he's gonna to say, that's enough, I give up. Listen, that's who we are. That's how we are. But that is not how God is. That is not how he is. It's his character and his nature. The first and the greatest reason for Paul's confidence is in the one who began the work. But we also notice another reason here in the middle of this verse. It's the nature of the work. It's a good work. This was no ordinary work that God had begun in their midst. It was a gospel work. On Paul's second missionary journey, he had a vision of a Macedonian man who had come to him and was asking for help in this vision. And so he concluded, uh, he and some others concluded the Holy Spirit was calling them to preach the gospel in the Macedonian region. And so he goes there, and the, the first stop on this tour is Philippi. Paul is the first guy in, so to speak. He breaks the ground on this project. And so he sees how the Lord moves initially through the preaching of the gospel. That's what he sees. Lydia is the first person to have responded to that message, but many others believed along the way, and the changes in their lives be, were immediate. The changes in these folks' lives were immediate. It began, the fruit of the gospel began to be very evident in their midst. It showed up in obvious ways, and Paul had seen the change. Paul had seen it with his own eyes. Yes, they were immature in a lot of ways, and yes, they still faced a lot of challenges, but the only possible explanation for Paul for their before and their after had to have been that God was at work in their midst. That was the only possible explanation for the change that he had seen. And so we see that Paul had played an initiating role in this. He, he was part of this work. He was the messenger who came and delivered the message of Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected. And yet here, he's not taking credit for it. He's not, saying, he's not, he's not placing himself there. Nor does he place any of his confidence in his ability to talk, his eloquence, or his example even. No, his confidence of what changed in their lives, what he saw change in their lives was not due to him. What he saw change in their lives really was the power of the gospel. That's, that's, that's what the gospel does. That's what he had seen it do over and over again. That's what it had happened in his life. 
That's what he had understood. The, power, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It changes people. It initiates a good work in them. When people hear it, it produces fruit in their lives. That's what the gospel does. That's the power that comes with the story. And so we may rightly ask, how do I know if God has begun that work in my life? How can I have that same sort of confidence in the gospel? Is there some sort of mystical experience that I'm supposed to have? Or a dream or, or some sort of initiation thing that's supposed to, to, to occur in my life? What we discover here is that the reasons for Paul's confidence, that should be our reasons for confidence, the exact same ones. What was the message that you heard? What was the story that you responded to? The initial change in the Philippians, it came through the story of Jesus Christ. It wasn't a message of try and do better and five steps and ways that you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. That's a man-made initiative. And man-made initiatives can never produce final confidence. The message of Jesus is what's been done in your place. That's what we respond to. And when we respond to that message, God is the one. God is the one who's taking what was outside, what happened outside of us, what happened 2,000 years ago in our place. God is the one who's taking what happened outside of us and he's working it into us. He's moving in our lives. He's producing fruit. And the power of that message is always going to produce fruit. And if it's done that in your life, it should give you clear assurance it should give you boldness. If that's the message you responded to and the fruit that showed up in your life when you responded to the story of Jesus Christ and the change that happened in you, it should give you that same confidence. God is the one who initiated that work. None of us here, none of us here can take credit for that. And when that's true, when we can't take credit for it, when the, story, when the, when the glory of Jesus Christ and the message of the gospel is what you can attribute it to, the fruit in your life, if that's what you can attribute it to, that's a good place to be. That is a confident place to be. That is a rock that you can stand on. But notice also that this good work didn't just stop at an individual level in Philippi. The in you, he references, is the location of God's work. God began a good work in you. And the you there is plural. He's referencing the whole church. God didn't only begin an isolated work in standalone Christians. He worked in individual lives, yes, but his work in their midst, this was the goal all along, his work in their midst was always meant to be a comprehensive work, a collective work. It's important that we don't see God's grace in Philippi at the individual level only. We have stories of individual people and individual homes that are changed, but it's important that we don't see his grace only at that level because his grace is shining the greatest in the body as a whole, in the church as a whole, people who wouldn't have been friends, folks who would have only thought about themselves and what they had going on and their own interests. Suddenly, those are the same people who now have a genuine love, a genuine concern for one another, even as they personally, some of them were facing their own suffering, and yet they have a concern for others in the body. These were the ones who held a common desire to see the gospel extended to other places where it hadn't been preached yet. And in order to do so, they had given generously to Paul to support him on his mission. They were willing to, to, to come together to do that for that purpose. What could it count? I mean, they're, they're enduring poverty themselves when they do this. When they're coming together with this common desire to see the gospel move. What could, what could account for this kind of love and service in people? Why do they have his passion for this story to be told to others? Is that not God's doing? Is that not God's doing in their midst? Who else are you going to attribute it to? We wouldn't have necessarily considered this a grand start. From a human perspective, it's an outpost of ordinary people. They're loving Jesus in a city that didn't love Jesus. At the same time, they're still dealing with their own sins, their own anxieties. Not a grand start. Human perspective doesn't look like much. But Paul says, I see something. I see something much, much greater. Something that human eyes can't see. I see the hand of God at work in your midst. That's what I saw. The gospel has been unleashed 
in Philippi. It's been unleashed among you. It's doing its work. It's bearing fruit. That's what I saw. That's God initiating a work. That's what Paul's saying here. Church, we have reasons. We have reasons for confidence this morning. Not in ourselves as if we're something special. We're not. But our confidence this morning is in the God who begins good work. And our confidence this morning is in the good-producing, life-changing gospel message that we have received. It's the same message. It hasn't changed. It has the same power. It hasn't lost it. Every testimony is unique, and every gospel-preaching church comes from many different roots. But if you listen closely, all the stories start to sound wonderfully familiar. They all open with the same phrase, He who began a good work in you. That's the beginning, that's the opening of every story. That's what they all share. That's what all of our testimonies, that's what they share in common. He who began a good work in you. And he began it through the gospel message. Church, that's our reason for confidence this morning. But reasons alone don't bring us an experience of confidence. We're meant to rely on these reasons. We're meant to to bank on them. Could it be that we don't experience the confidence that belongs to us? It actually belongs to us as Christians. Because we don't spend enough time consciously relying on our reasons for confidence. Our support is not flimsy. Naive American optimism is a cheap, cheap substitute for Christian confidence. It collapses at the first sign of trouble. But the gospel was built. The gospel was built to carry weight. It's meant to handle the weight of our deepest worries, of our deepest longings, of our deepest desires and fears. A decade after the church had begun, I bet that gospel work that God had started in them, in their consciousness, it probably had begun to fade a little bit. All the other things that we had just we read about, they creep in and they have their effect. They chip away at that confidence. They come from different angles, different times, but they chip away at that confidence. But Paul hadn't forgotten what he had seen. And he hadn't forgotten his reasons for confidence. They hadn't changed. They still stood in church. They're still standing. We have reasons for confidence. That leads us to the second point. Notice the extent. This is the end of the verse. The extent of Paul's confidence. It's right there. He will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. The main verb in this sentence is future tense. Did you catch that? main thrust of this verse, it's future-oriented. It's aimed at the future. God has saved them, yes. He was saving them when Paul is writing this letter, yes. But this verse reveals that God has every intention to fully save them in the future. Paul is speaking of their salvation here in future terms. He's talking about, get this, he's talking about actions in the future. Actions in the future that God is going to take on their behalf. Actions in the future that God is certainly going to take on their behalf for those who have trusted in Jesus. And that's crucial to pick up on. The good news that we have believed, that we have trusted in, it includes a future element. It includes a future element. A Christian's confidence comes from the cross, yes, absolutely. But it's also meant to be forward-looking. There's a future aspect of Christian hope. In the Old Testament, the day of the Lord often referenced the coming judgment day, where God is revealed as the true and righteous judge over and above everything else, the sovereign one. It will be a day when worldly confidence will fail. It will fail. But just as there's a direct connection, a direct link between Jesus' first coming, when he first came, and the work that God initiated in our lives, there's a direct link there. Just as that's the case, there's also a direct link 
a direct link between the work that God will complete in our lives and the coming revelation of Jesus Christ. There's a connection there too, and we have to see that. Because that is the extent of our confidence. That's the extent of our confidence. The early church understood this to be a central tenet of the faith. After Jesus taught his disciples about his return, that he was coming back, and then he ascended into heaven, his disciples increasingly viewed this coming day not as the day of the Lord, but as the day of Jesus Christ. Even as Christians, we're certainly going to be accountable to the Lord for how we lived our lives. It, it matters. It will matter on that day. But the emphasis for Christians is no longer judgment. The emphasis for Christians is completion. That will be the day. That will be the day when God's final product in our lives and in our church is revealed. And at the exact same moment that that's happening, get this, it will prove, it will prove that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is exactly the Lord and Savior that he claimed to be when he was here. He will be vindicated and he will be glorified when we, those of us who are trusting in him, are completely saved from God's wrath and from our own sin. He will be vindicated. He will be glorified. And we want to be clear here. He doesn't need us on that day. He doesn't need any of us here to be vindicated and to be glorified. On the day that he returns, his glory is not going to be lacking in any way. If you've read Revelation, you see his glorified, what, what John saw. It's not going to be lacking. But in his undeserved grace, he has committed himself to saving us. And once he's done that, once he committed himself to saving us, there's no way he's not going to complete it. It can't happen. His own glory requires that. It's totally and completely his commitment to link our future salvation with his glory. That was his commitment, totally. But he will not allow anyone, anyone who has called on his name in that day to be lost or, get this, unfinished. If you've called on his name, he won't allow that to happen. His own fame, his own fame demands that to be the case. How often do you consider this future aspect of the gospel? And if you do spend time thinking about it, do you sit in amazement that Christ's return means not somebody else's, but your perfection? Your own perfection. I think most of us are very familiar with all the unfinished part of God's work in our lives. We can could, we could name them. I'm still, this morning, I'm very aware, driving here to preach this message, I'm very aware of the sin that remains in my heart. And as much as I'm aware of, there's probably two and three times as much that I don't even have a clue about. I don't even see it yet. But I wonder, I wonder if we are as aware, we're aware of that, but I wonder if we also, are we also as aware that God has promised himself to bring us to completion? Are we aware of that? Because Paul was, that's part of the good news. Listen, we aren't denying in saying this that we don't have a very long way to go. That's not what we're saying. But we are declaring this. We declare this, that Jesus Christ cannot fail. When he returns, he will not be denied. He will not be dishonored. And that means, what that means for us is saving to the uttermost. We're meant to be delighted in the hope Delighting in the hope that our glorification and the glory of Jesus Christ are now linked. They're put together. They didn't have to be, but he put them together. He merged them. And that's the extent of our confidence this morning. He put those things together, and that's our confidence. He's the one who initiated, but he's going to finish it. And if you're like me, that's so hard to wrap your mind around sometimes, to get your arms around. But I want to speak to something this morning that I think we just have to do away with if we're going to grab a hold of this truth. It's what I would call false humility. We live in a culture of misplaced pride. 
we're very self-assured about a lot of things that we should not be. And in contrast to that arrogance, false humility, at least initially, has an appearance of godliness. The Holy Spirit has brought conviction in our lives. He's made us aware of our own sins, of our own weaknesses. And that's a good thing. That's a wonderful thing. That's part of God initiating his work in our lives. But a lot of people don't get to that point, so that's a good thing. I want to establish that. That's a good thing. But conviction of sin was never meant to produce a continual woe is me Christian. A continual, a Christian who's all he talks about and all he thinks about and all he understands and all he feels are his own shortcomings. That's what I'm talking about. All the things that we aren't. Instead, conviction is meant to lead us to all the things that he is. That's, what, that's the aim of conviction. When you feel that in your life, that's what it's meant to draw. Go look and see how Jesus fulfilled that in your place. Go look and see what he did. Specifically, whatever it is, go look and see what he, if, if it's a sin of commission, go look and see how he resisted that commission, you know, resisted that sin. If it's a sin of omission where I felt like, man, I should have done that, go look and see where he did that. That's where it's meant to lead us to, to find that forgiveness because of his record. That's what conviction is meant to do. It's meant to lead us to all that he is. But here's the other thing it's meant to do. Conviction is meant to point us towards all, as we do that, it's meant to point us towards all that we already are in him. What's already ours in him. False humility denies the work that God is doing in our lives, that he began in our lives. And it denies the joy of awaiting our coming glorification. Listen, if you feel, if you feel there is no way, no way, other people Sure. People, people in my small group that just seem amazingly godly. Sure. If you think, but me? There's no way. I deserve that on that day. Perfection. I don't deserve perfection on that day. How could I ever deserve perfection on that day? The answer is easy. You don't. None of us do. Not one of us here. But get this, he deserves that. He deserves that. The good news is not, woe is me. The good news is worthy is he. That's the good news this morning. That's the good news. That's the extent. That's why they're linked. That's why they're merged. That's our hope. It's the extent of your hope, Christian. We're meant to feel that. So practically, how, how do we? How do we begin to go about that? I mean, there's this tension, right? That introduces the tension into our lives. And it's, it's hard to wrestle through. It's it a little messy wrestling through tensions. How do I not downplay what I already am in Christ, what I've already been given, the already aspect of my salvation, the assured perfection that's already mine, the position I already have before the Lord? How do I not downplay that? <clears throat> and then on the other side, you know, without becoming proud, and then on the other side, how do I not fall into this ditch of, uh, of false humility? Well, the Bible reaches in and it pulls us out of both of them. It pulls us out of both of them. The gospel leads us towards a humble confidence. A humble confidence. It's humble and that we don't deserve it. None of us deserves it. We talked about that. We can't take credit for any of it. Ultimately, none of it. We have, we have a part to play, but we can't take credit for it. But it's confident because God is the one who started the work. His promises cannot fail. He's promised to finish it. And in fact, as surprising as this sounds, the New Testament calls us more towards confidence than it even does humility. Because the greater that our confidence is in Christ... The higher that we see him and his worth and his assurance, the greater humility it works into our lives. It, it, it moves it into our lives. One comes before the other. We're meant to grasp the already aspect of our salvation first 
so that when, then we can grow in walking out the not yet parts, the parts that still we do need to work on. They're still present. Listen, our glorious future is meant to invade our messy present. It's, me, it's meant to work backwards from the end to the begin, back to, the, to where we are now. The future works into our present. It's meant to empower our present. It's meant to embolden our present with a humble confidence. Anthony Hokema in his book, The Bible in the Future, he says this about the already not yet tension. I found it very helpful. Our self-image should reflect this tension. By self-image, I mean the way a person looks at himself, his conception of his own worth or lack of worth. The fact that the Christian finds himself in between what he already possesses in Christ and what he does not yet enjoy implies, this is a very helpful description, he should see himself as an imperfect new person. Yet, the emphasis should not fall, should fall rather, not on the continued imperfection, but on the newness. To lay the emphasis on the imperfection instead of the newness is to turn the New Testament upside down. As Oscar Coleman puts it, for the Christian believer today, the already outweighs the not yet. Isn't that last sentence so encouraging? Christian, is your already, is your already outweighing the not yet? The extent of our confidence, the gospel has a future aspect. That's the extent of our confidence. And so, do you struggle Do you struggle, and we all struggle, do you struggle, though, as one that's already victorious? Because we all struggle, we're all going to struggle. But do you struggle as one that's already victorious in Christ? Because the greater our confidence, the greater our strength in the face of sin and anxieties. The greater our confidence, the more likely we are to step out happily and serve others. The greater our confidence, the less we're going to be enslaved to the opinions of other people. The greater our confidence, the more likely we are to take risks for the name of this Jesus Christ who is going to perfect us on the day. We don't have anything to lose. And so we step out to serve in his name, to glorify his name, to take risks in his name, things that we would not be able to do if we weren't assured of the end. So Christ, in Christ, Christian, do you struggle as one who's already victorious, already won. Even in the midst of realism, the New Testament is overwhelmingly optimistic for the Christian, overwhelmingly optimistic. And the reason it's so optimistic, the reason it deals with real life issues, but it's still so optimistic, is because of who stands behind it. These aren't words for words' sake. They're glorious truths. They're meant to be celebrated. They're meant to be walked in. They're meant to be believed. A few short months later, Churchill's warnings proved true. The Nazis began their assault over the skies of London, and the Battle of Britain began. It turned into a long, months-long, bloody war of attrition. And the will of the Brits was pushed to the brink. But in the end, it was the Germans who blinked first. And for the first time in eight years ever, Hitler lost. And as it turns out, a lot of of things happened after that, but as it turns out, that alone, that stand alone was enough to change the entire course of the world war and the world we live in now. Because the people knew that they were going to fight. That had already been decided. They didn't get to pick that. They didn't have control over that. They knew they were going to fight. But they were never going to surrender. That had already been decided. So the end for them, it wasn't in question. 
There's going to be days of fighting, but at the end, it wasn't in question. Church, for all that we don't know, whatever tomorrow is going to bring and the week ahead, for all that we aren't, all the ways that we're very aware that we're not, this we do know. He, He is the one who began a good work in us, and He cannot and will not ever, ever fail. He will not let us go. His own glory will not allow it. And oh, the glory of knowing that He is the one on that day. He is the one, the one who is returning and being revealed on that day. He is the one who is bringing it to completion in your life. The one who's on the throne on that day is the one who's working in you now. He's the one that began a good work. The glory of knowing it's him. Beginning to end, it always has been, always will be, the theme of our lives, the theme of our church, the confidence that we have, it's him. It's in him. Our end is not, church, our end is, is not in question. On that day, it is not in question. And in that, and that alone rests our confidence. Let's pray. Lord, it is a gift to us this morning. You knew exactly where each of us were when we woke up. You brought us here. It is fitting that on the first day of the week, we come and receive from you. We declare by doing this that we are not, but that we trust you. And so no matter what we're facing this morning, you knew it. And thank you for the kindness of recording these words of Paul 2,000, almost 2,000 years ago to speak to us this morning, to assure us that we have the same hope in Jesus Christ, to lift up the glory of your son, Jesus. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would do that. You would do what these words were meant to do. By your power of your spirit, would you bring confidence and boldness and assuredness in the gospel and in your nature. Bring us a delight a rejoicing. Help it to be a corporate one. Help it to be together that we confess these things to one another and we encourage each other in these things. And Lord, in the end, it will be our joy on that day to see that you were the one who began the work, to see clearly, to see all the moments even this week that you carried us and to realize that you alone because of your glory, have brought it to completion. Do that in our lives, we pray. By your grace alone and for your glory. Amen.